Welcome to the Lessons Led Podcast. I'm thrilled to introduce our guest this month, Keith George. Keith is a nationally recognized senior talent leader with a highly successful and demonstrated history of working in the healthcare human resources industry with several of the largest healthcare systems in the country and beyond. Uh, Keith is skilled in talent management, organizational design, learning development, performance management, executive search, technical recruiting, and succession planning. Keith is an accomplished business development professional and holds his Bachelor of Arts focused in human resources and services from Webster University in St. Louis. Keith currently serves as the Vice President of Strategy and Workforce Analytics for BJC Healthcare in St. Louis and previously served as the senior director over all of talent acquisition for Ascension Healthcare, uh, covering their 22 states and over 170,000 employees. Previous to that, Keith made the transition into the healthcare industry, having worked with uh, Comcast and having worked with Discover and many other large uh, organizations that I'll have Keith uh, share with us a little bit further. Welcome to the uh, Lessons Led podcast, Keith. Uh, thank you, Keith. Glad to be here. Well, we're excited to have you here, and I uh, am always interested, and more importantly, the uh, audience is uh, especially interested in just hearing your career path and your journey, and so I'd love to hear, if you if you could, just take me back in the time machine just a little bit to your very first job and kind of work me up to the present, because you you have a, a very fascinating career path and, and uh, journey that you've been on. Yeah, no, I, I, uh, it has been a journey at that. It is, um, I, I started off in uh, third-party recruitment and I started off with a little boutique uh, firm answering the phones while I was delivering pizzas and going to school. So it was a, um, it, it has uh, been, been, a, been a journey, but uh, it really laid some good foundation for me with my career. I, like I said, I started off doing non-exempt recruitment, went in from non-exempt recruitment to exempt, and then um, started running a branch um, for uh, this recruitment firm and, and uh, ultimately ended up being kind of their, their um, road warrior that went out and I would, uh, I've lived in nine different cities and I, I um, went and would go into a market, I would open a market and I would um, bring it to a certain level of sales and then I'd move on. And so I did that for almost 15 years and, and uh, I, I created this centralized model of how we supported all of our recruitment efforts in all of our branches. And, uh, and, and the recruitment firm was, um, was uh, specific to the restaurant and hospitality industry. And how I kind of broke my way into Fortune 500 world was Chase had found out that uh, restaurant and hospitality people were their highest performing, lowest attrition group in their contact centers. And they were looking for someone that had done that in a centralized fashion. Hmm. And so um, I, I uh, went to work for Chase and, and that's where my journey really began in talent acquisition and transforming teams and, and learned a lot um, there, learned corporate world, um, uh, which, was, which was a big change from the environment that I was in. But I had a great leader there that really taught me around data and how data matters and process and, and how, how you use data to, to manage performance, tell stories, to mitigate risk. And, and so um, I centralized the team there in the field. I ultimately ended up going into um, professional recruitment and, and, and uh, left Chase um, to go to Discover. And uh, Discover was, was an interesting um, uh, exhibition in my leadership. And I, I think I, I learned a lot there um, at Discover. So Chase, I would classify as when I was with them was more of a top-down approach, kind of, mm -hmm. kind of a senior leader um, says something and you go execute it, right? Where um, Discover was more of a, hey, you, we want you to be entrepreneurial. We want you to have ownership over this. We want you to, you know, we believe if you treat our people well, our people are going to treat our customers well. And so um, I went in um, originally um, in the corporate kind of managing the landscape of, of corporate recruiting and ultimately ended up out in the field centralizing their model um, for Discover. So um, I had uh, then made the transition um, back to um, St. Louis and, and, uh, and uh, went to where I kind of entered into population health, which was with a company called Lumeris, which is... Mm -hmm. Um, really around how do you take 
kind of patient payer provider information and do predictive modeling around that and help with the continuum of care. And, and it was a John Doerr led organization um, with uh, Mike Long as the CEO, which, which uh, he, he had a big, big uh, influence over WebMD. And, and so had a lot of great leaders um, involved in that. And, and that passion really kind of opened my eyes around healthcare. And, and so, um, and, and, you know, as you said, I transitioned over into, to, um, uh, went, went from, from this kind of startup entrepreneurial company where I've owned and built everything to it, to jumping into a massive organization like Ascension and being able to, and, and really Ascension, and, and this has kind of been my, my story through my career, Ascension was moving from a holding company to an operating company, right? And they were looking to, to bring in and, and how do they create centers of excellence and, and, and how do they do things in a consistent manner? So I was brought in to help do that with Ascension and modernize their approach to, to recruiting. And, and uh, you know, frankly, um, I, I loved Ascension and Ascension was a great organization. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, this is where kind of personal life intervenes into professional life, where, where I was a, let's call it an early adopter of COVID. I got uh, COVID very early, had, a, had, had um, some significant health issues with, with COVID and, and started reevaluating, um, you know, kind of, I was on the road, I think, it, uh, I think I had 141 hotel night stays um, the previous year. And, and I, have a, I have a 19 year old daughter now and an 11 year old daughter now, and that impacts your relationship with your family. And so when you're sitting in a hotel bed or hotel bed, I'm sorry, you're sitting in a hospital bed and you're thinking, yep. what are the things important in life? Um, you start thinking about what you've missed out on on that. So I was fortunate enough, and this is where I think, um, you know, kind of life intervenes and or whatever faith you believe in intervenes that um, uh, somebody introduced me to my, my current boss at BJC who was moving here from moving to St. Louis from um, Dallas and they're moving from a holding company to an operating company. And, That's right. and, and I agreed to, wasn't looking for a job, just agreed to um, have an introductory conversation with her and her and I just hit it off. And, and so that's kind of led me to my role where I'm at now with, with BJC, where I have our, I have our um, talent strategy team, which consists of physician recruitment, um, kind of our core recruitment, as well as contingent labor. And, and then uh, we have our, our um, you know, recruitment and marketing branding team. I have our HR analytics and I have our HR operations. I've expanded my role to, I'm sorry, HR operations team. So um, I've expanded my role over the last year here. So it's been, uh, it's been a, quite a journey. It has been quite a journey and, and an impressive one uh, as well. And, and I appreciate your sharing the uh, where the, the personal meets the professional because you, you can't separate the two. And, uh, and, and I think that, uh, you know, COVID for so many of our, our listeners as well, you know, we've, we've seen this great, uh, you know, resignation and we've seen this great reflection uh, happen. And it happened for me in my, my own career uh, to, uh, to uh, be quite candid as well and in, in going through a transition uh, in my career, from uh, the healthcare system perspective, to my to my current role, I, I'm curious. You know, Keith, we've we've seen an uptick in uh, resignations. Over 77, I think Becker's latest report was showing, and so it's up over 22 percent of CEOs uh, have resigned. And where CEOs are, will leave, uh, it it creates instability within the systems. We we see the likelihood is about 60% that the CMO will leave and about 40% that the CHRO will leave. So it, it creates quite a destabilizing uh, situation for healthcare systems. I'm curious, you know, kind of what your perspective is on kind of what, what's happening, what, what is going on within the, uh, the leadership C-suite? Well, I, I will say what's happening in the leadership C-suite is indicative of what's happening throughout all of healthcare right now, right? Is is that I think healthcare is in, in a transformational state right now. Um, you have a large percentage of our workforce population that's getting to retirement age, right? You have a new generation that's coming in. You have a care delivery model that because of some of these generational um, differences, 
people want to receive care in different ways. And, mm -hmm. and really, there and, and our healthcare systems work on such a thin margin anyway, that you look at the pressure that's being put on these C-suites to change how the care is being delivered while still pro providing remarkable patient satisfaction and clinical excellence and, 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 and all of that, right? But yet do it in an environment where cost structure is going up, re retention is going down, you have, and you don't have a model to, you don't have a mechanism to, it's not like a restaurant where you can just, hey, cost of beef goes up, I'm going to charge more for a hamburger. It's not right. how it works in our, so you, you're reliant upon how do you become more efficient? How do you become, while well, still not jeopardizing some of that? And I think that pressure is getting to, and listen, the past two years, this pandemic has Everybody has been emotionally um, um, involved in this, right? And we have right. these caretakers that that have been taking care of people for so long that now they're starting to set back and say, "I need to take care of myself." And That's and right. so there's a there's just a I think there's a lot of um, energy going on in the healthcare segment right now, and there and, and it's. And I think you know you, you have a few people that that you either run to the challenge or or you can you can mm -hmm. say hey I'm gonna give this I'm gonna step aside and give somebody else a try at this and, and I think there's there's a lot of factors that are happening I don't think it's just one thing but I mean this is a complex and 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 uh, complex issue that we're gonna have to solve as an industry and and because I don't think anybody solved it yet. No, I I, I think you're spot on, and uh, I think the other. Uh, pressure point I hear uh, about that was launched in July is the pricing transparency as well and systems that are, you know, having to aggressively move to uh, price transparency and, and really, you know, uh, uncover and better understand their pricing models and structures and, and that now from a consumerism perspective is putting even more, you know, pressure on uh, uh, healthcare systems, not to mention uh, the different models of care that are out there in the surgical centers and, and uh, emergency rooms without beds and some of those things, uh, you know, as, as well. And uh, I've, uh, you know, also heard that a, a number of the leaders, they, they went through the pandemic and they led their teams and their staff through those and they're, they're tired and they, and they also, they learned other skills and some of them are jumping into other, uh, you know, lines of you know, healthcare uh, business uh, as a result of that as well, uh, having moved through that. Um, I, I think the the other, you know, thing that really comes to mind for me, and I think about, you know, your responsibility and your responsibility for your your team is this uh, impending, this shortage that we're not, it's not new for us, right? But the, the gig workforce, the some of the statistics I see are that we'll be 1.2 million nurses short by 2030. We'll be, uh, you know, close to 140,000 physicians short by around that same, you know, time frame as well. And so, um, I, I'm I'm curious. I mean, how how are you solving for this? How are you addressing this? And um, and your thoughts about. Uh, the supply and and the demand and you know what how that's impacting your healthcare system and other healthcare systems across the country. Yeah, I mean it's a real thing. And and, and Keith, I, I've seen statistics that are saying that I have a vendor that sent me um, a stat that in 2023 we're going to be 1.1 million nurses short. So I mean it, wow. I don't know that there's there's a a true um, a stat out there, but th we all know that we're short, right? And, and it, it's, and what I will tell you is that, you know, I think healthcare used to be such a desired industry to, to go to. And I think it's lost a little bit of that luster and we got to bring that back and we got to bring the mission back to the, to, to, to um, healthcare and, and, and serving your community and your and 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 the families that surround you, and and because what's really happened is that that you know we we the number one industry right now that people are leaving is healthcare. The second is education. That's scary wow. for our communities, right? And that that's with an that, aging population, especially right, and well, what we're what we're facing. Yeah, I mean, you have you have, um, I think the average age of a nurse right now is fifty five. And and so you're and you look at what what's in our schools and what's coming into our systems 
our schools are, are not at max capacity, right? And and right. so we got we have a we already have an issue, but we it's getting worse. So what I will tell you is is that we got to figure out how to how to automate, right? We got to figure out how to um, how do we um, give care in different manners, and how do how do we um, look at and and get our nurses working at the top of their license. So how do we surround them with with the with the um, proper amount of support? But that goes with with our leaders too. I mean, span of control is out of out of control in many of our leaders, right? And so right. we just have to look and at at how we're how we're delivering care in a different way. But what I will tell you is is that. We are aggressively looking at how do how do we embrace the gig economy, right? How do we how do we make it easy for people to pick up shifts, whether you work a shift for us a week, a shift for us a year, whatever it might be. And then how do we look at internally for people to 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 do that? We're we're also um, you know heavily looking at our SNT population and looking at the at at um, LPNs and looking at different ways that we can um, um, you know bring care. Um, and and then you know there's there's a, a lot uh, around how do we improve our pipeline and how do yep. we get in, into um, and and get more people interested in healthcare. So it is a grassroots effort. I mean, it is now we're doing like everybody else. We're out there recruiting experienced nurses like crazy, right? And right. we're experiencing. But even I'll tell you, I mean. I think healthcare is going through a renaissance within technology, right? And bringing technology and finding technology and how we how do how do we create a better patient experience? How do we create a better experience for our employees? How do we like technology is a hard space for us to recruit in right now for for healthcare. So I mean, there it's not just yes, it is you know kind of patient facing, but overall it's it's just difficult. So we have to we have to truly be be. Um, looking at how do we pioneer different ways to to attract talent and bring talent into our organization, and most importantly, how do we keep it? How do we develop it? And how do we engage with our talent? Now, and you and you call out a really important point, and and for those of us you know in in healthcare, and and I think that we're uh, accustomed to this that we are seven twenty four, and that we not only are recruiting clinical nurse professionals and physicians, uh, but the allied staff and laundry linen and housekeeping and uh, admissions and uh, billing, all of those services that have to um, you know, work hand in hand and you're competing with uh, the retail industry and every other industry out there, uh, especially as we're seeing uh, like in California, minimum wage moving to 15, 50 an hour or moving, you know, continuing to escalate in some of the states as well. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, I, I've certainly been in, impressed with uh, your work as well has been in the clinical academic, you know, partnerships and, and, uh, you know, just having been up in St. Louis this past week, you know, I was just impressed with all of the building and development you all have going on, on there and, and uh, the, the storefront, so to speak, that you have with, with Wash U there and the partnership with them is, is tremendous. And I think that's another area that we just have to continue to grow your own. I'm so glad to hear you say I've been through the uh, the period where we, you know, we saw LPNs kind of being removed from the bedside and, and you know, that short-sighted, uh, you know, that was, right, that now we're, you know, uh, we're needing every one of those uh, LPNs, the nursing assistants and, you know, RNs, BSNs, we, we need uh, all of them as well as the other uh, professionals. I'm, I'm curious, uh, Keith, you know, to transition just a little bit into the leadership, you know, development and uh, from a talent acquisition and executive search perspective, you know, what are some of the, uh, especially for our, our audience of emerging leaders, what are the characteristics or qualities when you're, when you're got a CFO search or you've got a, you know, a, a, a executive C-suite search that you're working on or director level search, you know, what are, you know, how, how do you go about um, determining kind of this, is, this is the skill set, the, the culture fit. Uh, I'm just want to get, get inside your head just a little bit and understand how you make that, that selection. Yeah, I think, I think first and foremost, and what it, what I really uh, try to instill within our team is that we got to, we have to get close to the business. We have to understand our business, right. And we have to be close to those leaders and, and really, 
I mean, you can, there, there's technical competencies that are just like, you just have to have, right? Those are, those are the cost of admission. And, and then, then, then you have kind of the cultural elements of, of um, that, that you need to understand, not only sometimes within a business unit, but overall within our organization and how you fit into that. And, and then it really is, you know, understanding what outcomes are you trying to drive and how are you trying to get there? And then kind of having, I'm not, a, I, I will tell you, I am not a big believer in tell me about a time or I'm much more of a situational interview. I'm much more of a conversation. I think we can find more about a candidate by being transparent about what we're looking for and asking and, and having dialogue about how their background fits into what we're trying to accomplish and, and how they would, and their methodology and how they, so I take maybe a little bit um, different approach than, than some, right? And, and not that some are um, better or, or worse than others, but it's just my belief that, that if we can sit down candidate to, to HR professional and say, hey, let's talk about what we're trying to, what we need out of this role, what we want out of this role and not try to catch them in, oh, you don't have, and I, I'm a big, I'm a big seek for the yes, right? Seek, let's seek for the yes and try to, try to find out some commonality and where we can with candidates and, and, and let's be transparent about where we're having issues, what we're having, what, what, what we need you to step into. And then let's, let's listen and listen closely and, and try, you know, I think, um, listening is a is an acquired skill. So many people are so worried about asking their next question, they're right. not necessarily listening to the answer that they get, right? And then and then I'm a big believer that we have to have a standardized format on how we're assessing candidates and 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 what is a good versus average versus poor and how do we align that with all of our organization and and then how do we make sure we have the right people that are getting input into the decision? I mean, there's just a methodology behind it that, that we use um, for, for all of our searches, but executive in particular, it's a little bit um, you know, more high touch on, on the executive side, of course. Ab absolutely, and, I, and I, I love the methodology that you use and actually in, in differentiating that. And, uh, and, and to your point, there, uh, there are some studies that I've, I've read that you know, a third of the time, you know, the selection for a leader is just spot on. And a third of the time it, you know, it's, it's mm -hmm. good. And then a third of the time you kind of miss the mark. And so there's, there's not a perfect predictive uh, tool out there. Uh, I think there are, you know, great talent assessments and uh, some great behavioral assessments that you can use. But to your point, getting to know the candidate, how they fit in, uh, fit into the culture and, and as well, uh, you know, what their leadership style is and where the organization is at. I want to turn it back to you just a little bit. This is a question I don't think that I've, um, you and I have known each other for, for some time, and I don't think I've ever asked you this particular question. So not to throw you a curveball, but I, I, I just, I, I wondered, Keith, if you had the opportunity to take three people to dinner uh, with us, you know, living or from, from the past, um, just to get to know you a little bit, who are those three people, and why would you pick those three three individuals? Just three. Yeah, that, that's fair. And uh, you know, I'm a big sports guy, so I'm trying to think of not <laughs> making it all all related to to sports people. But um, you know, the, Michael Jordan would definitely be one for me. Um, I would I would probably want to bring in somebody in the realm of like a Jackie Robinson, somebody that really just crashed down barriers. And, and, and then um, Bill Clinton, I'm a, I'm a big Bill Clinton fan. So interesting. Uh, um, I, I like his story of, of how he kind of has, has risen. And I just think, you know, those are three people just off the top of my head that, that I, I admire for different reasons that I think would be interesting to have a, have a dinner conversation with. Yeah, I, I love that. No, and there is no right or wrong, you know, answer to that, uh, you know, obviously, and I appreciate it just coming off off the cuff there. And I just I'm I'm trying to kind of now picture in my head you there with those three and how entertaining that particular yeah. there there would definitely uh, uh, be a lot of good conversation and, and laughter. But I think some deep intellectual, you know, discussions about um, leadership and, you know, their impact and I'm just thinking that, you know, uh, three individuals who would be pretty humble about, you know, their, their roles as well. 
Yeah, I'm not so sure how humble Michael Jordan is, but uh, I, I certainly would <laughs> be interested in, uh, uh, you know, listen, I, I love his story that he got cut from his, his sophomore year in, in high school and became the world's best basket and most recognized and how he transformed. He really brought the NBA into the world and how he transformed sports figures into marketing and how he made a career. Like, I just think there's so many different uh, Facets, dynamics yeah. Yeah, that you could talk to him about. Uh, with that but yeah I mean it's it's a great a great group no I I love the number 42 and I love just the whole I am a big time Michael Jordan you know fan uh as well and I just have used him you know as as reference point as well that you know all too often he is one that you it looks like he makes things so easy and simple but you know he's he had taken that shot you know thousands of times um so there was a reason why he had the ball in his hands at, at the very end. And, um, and so turning, and you know, know, sorry, just real quick, just with, yeah. with Jackie Robinson, think of the resiliency. And that's yeah. what I think that we, we really are experiencing right now in the world. And especially within healthcare, like we have to be resilient. Think of the resiliency he had to have to go through. And, and I mean, that just, that I'm in awe of that as I've, if you've ever watched his story or any of the yeah. movies, it, it just it just amazes me it is um it just shows if you really want something and you're resilient and you have enough fortitude to get through it that you can just about accomplish anything i i love that and i love the, i love you're actually finishing out on that that point or, or further uh expanding upon that because i i i think about just in uh the leaders that i've worked with over my career and that you know, all too often, you know, folks may look at them and think, wow, it must be nice to be the CEO, must be nice to be, and yeah. and all along, people don't realize the, the resiliency, the sacrifices, the hours, countless hours and work and dedication and sacrifices, really, and I, and I think about that, that with you and, and just in your career and, you know, having, you know, been a road warrior, uh, as you mentioned, you know, earlier, having... I think when I had first met you living apart from your family in, in Houston and kind of traveling back and forth. And so yeah. giving up, you know, all, all week long. And so sacrifices are a big part of leadership. And I'm, I'm just curious, you know, resumes tell us a lot and conversations tell us, you know, uh, more uh, and getting to know folks, but there's always, you know, I think, a, you know, something that, you know, folks uh, don't know or would, would be interested to know. I'm curious what, what what about you and what's not on your resume or what have we not touched on that I, folks would be interested to to know or learn about you, Keith? You know, I think um, I, I guess I alluded to a little bit. I've been a grinder, right? And that that I I have worked um, my way up and 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 I have have learned a lot of lessons along the way. But I'm a pretty competitive guy, right? Um, but at the end of the day. Um, you know, it, it's, it's always family first for me. I've been um, fortunate. I've, uh, some of the jobs that I, I didn't really go into this, I've left because my wife is very successful and has her own career. And we've made those decisions based on, on her career, right? So I, I think it, it's, um, while I am, I am competitive and I want to drive results and I'm process driven and structured and all that kind of stuff, at the end of the day, I want I want uh, everybody on my team to feel like family can always come first, and that they that that you know I care about their quality of life and and what they're doing, and that's sometimes hard as you get bigger teams to to convey through throughout the organization, and and so I, I I'm very intentional and try to make sure everybody feels that, and and um, while I want us to win. I want us to win the right way, and I want us to to have fun and 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 be able to enjoy that with our families. I love that, and and I it kind of takes me back to kind of the Toyota model, and just you know respect for people first and foremost, and respect for people and their families, and treating uh, everyone as though they were created in the image of, and with compassion and dignity and with respect. And these are real, real humans. Uh, I had a conversation with a leader recently that you know talked about you know treating um, nurses as humans first, and nurses, clinical nurses second, right, yeah. and. Nice. And, you know, how we communicate and being very intentional to take your words uh, and how we communicate with them, because that's really somebody's spouse that's going home every day or mom or dad or brother, sister or what have you that, um, you know, they're they're coming in and working hard. But 
um, but it is it is a balance. And if the you know pandemic didn't teach us anything, it it certainly reminded us of the importance and the uh, for, you know how fragile life you know can be and the importance of of family uh, for sure. Well, Keith, I think we're you know coming to uh, the near end of our podcast here, and just I'm always amazed at how quickly time flies when I begin uh, you know dialoguing with the guests, and 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 you're no exception to that. I I just wanted to ask one last question here, if I if I may, if you could you know share some of your lessons learned or words of wisdom to this emerging healthcare workforce. I've uh, I, I, I probably will say this a couple of times, uh, you know, I mean, healthcare needs you now, healthcare needs those that are listening more than ever right now. And I'm just curious, what words of wisdom or pearls of wisdom would you share with, with our listening audience? Yeah, and, and, and I'll, I'll, go, I'll go around this to, to with the lens of that I have a 19 year old that's a sophomore at the University of Alabama right now, right? And, and I, I see, and I worry that so much of this TikTok social media culture is about it, it is about flash more than substance, right? And 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 I truly worry about our new generation and what I tr- what I believe is a calling for people, whether it's the military, whether it's first responders, whether it's nurses, teachers. Like I worry about that generation with 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 our people because to me the the true social influencers out there are those people. It's our teachers, it's our nurses, it's our it's it's our military, it's our it's our police officers. It's like so so that's really what what I I want people to connect to and get back to understanding that it's more it's more than just about you. It's more about what than what you can. Um, show that you have. It's about how, what impact and how can you make impact in your community. And in particular, one of the things I love about BJC is we have a strong focus on our underserved communities. How do we end poverty? How do we help in the discrepancy in healthcare? Like those are big challenges yes. in the communities, and we're running towards those. And we need people to help us with that, with those challenges, right? And so. Um, you know, what, what I would just compel people is to really think about, is it really um, what your passion is and what you want to do and how do you help your communities instead of, hey, what am I seeing as a, as a, you know, as a two minute or 30 second clip on or a picture on, on, on a social app. And that could be me just, my daughter would probably tell me that's just me being old, <laughs> but <it's, laughs> I do worry about that. I think you're worried about it and worried about it for for the right reasons. And and you know, again, I, I love what you said earlier about we're going through a, a transformation in healthcare and and um and this is a renaissance. And I think, you know, through this, I hope and I pray too that we uh with not only the shortages we've talked about, but um it is incumbent upon us. Uh healthcare is a is a mission, a mission, healthcare is a calling, and we need uh, healthcare caregivers, healers, more now than ever. I um, can't begin to thank you enough, you know, for your service in healthcare and being a, a part of what makes healthcare uh, great and continuing to push forward with a uh, nationally recognized healthcare system that is uh, raising the bar. And to your point, more than more than anything else, serving the, the least among us and the underserved and uh, improving uh, the community and the patients and families that we're so blessed uh, to serve. Well, Keith, I, I again, I thank you so much for, for your time and taking time to come on the Lessons Led podcast. I'll just close with my uh, infomercial in, in saying that if, uh, if you would like the uh, Lessons Led podcast, like it, uh, subscribe to it and pay it forward and forward it to a friend uh, because we have great guests like Keith George that are uh, sharing their lessons uh, learned uh, in the healthcare industry. Keith, thank you so much. And I hope you have a blessed rest of your day. Uh, Thank you, Keith. Appreciate it. Good catching up. Thank you.